we would do exactly the same thing has there been no consciousness in our mind. My dear Oscar, how are you? <laughs> we, I know about myself, we believe we have conscious experience, each of us is sure that they have conscious experience, and we assume that the other ha has also. But science cannot give us any certainty about that, because if you are talking about a mechanism, Nothing can help you that. And let me give you a few examples. Here are, I'm a physicist, so here are billiard balls. And I'm analyzing their behavior. So all I need to calculate it is the laws of mechanics. There is no place for the experience of the balls, say, feeling pain and then repelling from one another. This is absolute nonsense. But it is not only that I don't need it for the calculation. If I put, take it into account, I'll, I'll get a wrong answer. The physical world is completely full energy, momentum, matter, there are conservation laws. There is no room for anything like that. It's only the laws of mechanics. I come home and I see that one of my pots, the, the plant is almost dry and I say, oh my goodness, it, it needs to have water. So I, I water it and then I can see the turgor pressure within the leaves and I say, it was, it was 30. No, it was not. And this is all just physics, not different than the billiard balls, just much, much more complicated. So there are laws and people here who know some physiology know what happens. There is water outside, there is water with uh, sea line or, or sugar inside, and there is, uh, there is osmosis and so on. We don't have to go into the details. Once again, I don't have the uh, precise calculation of uh, like the billiard balls, but if I have a computer strong enough which computes it, then, of course, I can't put into it anything like the thirst of the plant because I will get a wrong result. Less water, more water. Our world is very tight. And when I go to the doctor and he just examines my, my patella reflex, that, that's the same thing. My consciousness is not needed for that. Although I am conscious of being uh, hit by the hammer and uh, 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 replying with a kick. Now you know what goes at the end of this scale. Here is Romeo singing love songs to Juliet. And what science tells you is that if conservation laws are correct, and if psychology is reducible to biology, which people believe it is, and biology is reducible to chemistry and physics, then it's just the same. The fact that Romeo has the conscious experience of loving Juliet has nothing to do with what he and she are doing. According to another great British giant, Charles Darwin and the evolutionary theory, actually what we do has been shaped by evolution, procreation and so on. We would do exactly the same thing has there been no consciousness in our mind, just brains. I know it's, it sounds really strange, but here it is. Machines, computers do what we do, and sometimes even better than us in some functions which are called mental, and they keep advancing. There, we don't have to assume that there is anything conscious there, that there is any subjective experience of red and blue. There, there doesn't have to be anything like that, only the process. So here is the problem. The laws of mechanics completely explain the motions of billiard ball, plants, and even, even us. Just to make my point clear from another perspective, when I was in the, in the bathroom, I washed my hands with some detergent, with soap. So I say that the, the detergent molecule is hydrophobic in that it, 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 it is repelled of water. Now, come on, uh, there is no real phobia there. There is no fear. It's just electric, electric uh, interactions. Now here, this unicellular creature is photophobic. Right? If I shed light on it, it swims away. I don't need any fear. Uh, I don't need to invoke any fear. Just you have these flagella. When light hits them, they move, and then you get the net motion away from, from light. What about this guy? Now, he, he or she, it, I don't know, shows some fear from me. I can say that there is no real fear there. This is only just the mechanism. But you understand, I think it was Bertrand Russell who said, uh, a person who was not a communist in his youth has no heart. A person who has not ceased to be a communist has no brain. 
So here I either have no heart or have no brain because I don't know where to go to the extremities. If I say that this lobster, which is going to pinch me, is not afraid of me and it is only the sum of its reflexes, what about this case? Here is a human. Between it, there is my cat, there are my, uh, the chicken in my garden. Where along evolution do I talk about consciousness and rather than physical events? This may happen to you if you don't have too many cockroaches uh, at your home. If you have too many, then it won't happen to you. If you don't have, it won't happen either. But if you have a few cockroaches every few weeks, you may understand what happened to me one day. I saw a cockroach in my saloon. I didn't like the idea, so I went to this cockroach to do what humans usually do to cockroaches with whom they don't want to share their, their home. Uh, that cockroach didn't really uh, like my plans uh, about, about his or her future, and it climbed on a chair. Of course, I was not going to give up, so I picked up the chair, looked, uh, it was not there. I turned it around, it was not there. Come on, it, it was there a minute ago, so perhaps it went to the other side. I fl flipped, I turned it around, I didn't see it, and then I turned it around carefully and slowly, and then I saw the cockroach carefully and slowly moving <laughs> to the other side. Now you can imagine how silly I felt at that time, and a person standing there with, with that cr a creature uh, on the chair, and I'm thinking, does he, does she have real fear, or is it only reflexes? If I say that it has fear, I can go to the detergent molecule or to, to, to uh, that uh, unicellular uh, organism. If I say that there is no fear, what would I say about a human? Uh, I didn't solve the problem at that evening. I just walked out, placed the chair and said, do me a favor, go away. And <laughs> but the mystery is still there. So philosophers have invoked all kinds of isms in order, to, in order to explain it. I'll review them very briefly. So we all know physicalism. There were some eminent British philosophers who argued th this way. There is no consciousness. It's some illusion. You think that there is something unique to it because it's very complex. But actually, what you have in the universe is only physical laws, matter, energy, and that's it with relativity, quantum mechanics, but there is nothing other than the material world. This is what our forefathers believed in, our ancestors. There is dualism. There is matter. There is mind. Something comes from God. The, uh, we have a soul which goes into the matter, and this is the, the, the source of the mystery. Now, the worst case here is interactionist dualism, which all philosophers and especially physicists like me abhor, which say that there is actually something non-physical which interferes in what we do. This is what religion believes. That this is what, uh, I mean, even, even the person in the street believes, that there is something which is distinct from, from the body which interferes with it. it. From the physical viewpoint, it is an anathema, because that means that conservation laws are somehow wrong. Think again, and you can pause for a minute to think about it. Think again about the billiard balls. The billiard balls, if anything interferes with their motions, you will get a different result in the lab, and we never get it. What's the difference between billiard balls and brains? As far as we know, it's just a matter of complexity. But it's the same laws. They can be, even when quantum mechanics comes into the picture, they can be, turn into something statistical. But conservation laws are always obeyed. So this is what most physicists fear most, uh, interactionist dualism. The majority of philosophers, and the most genius among them, tried all kinds of non-interactionist dualism. They w didn't want to be as silly. How is Oscar? Can I see him for a minute? <laughs> My dear Oscar, how are you? Here you see the pristine consciousness of somebody <laughs> with the greatest mystery. And as we say in Hebrew, have a happy you, yeah. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> there is a mystery there, okay? And it's great. So, non interaction is dualism. This is what people like Bertrand Russell uh, and others believed. There is another aspect of matter which is distinct from, from the matter, but 
it's it just the same. You can ignore it because there is nothing which is immaterial which goes and interferes with what we are doing. So let me give you a few examples and you can't help admiring the genius of these people. I'm coming back to uh, Leibniz, epiphenomenalism. Uh, in German, it's called Stettentheoria, the theory of the shadow. And it goes something like this. I'm walking and my shadow is walking next to me. Whatever I do, my shadow is doing. Who is affecting whom? Or in order to uh, use Leibniz's uh, uh, example, there are two clocks, one big, one large, and they show exactly the same hour. So I may think that it's one clock which affects the other or the other which affects the, the first. And I, we understand that it's wrong. One watchmaker just made the two clocks and from now on they are in parallel. So suppose Oscar is thirsty and he cries and daddy gives him something to drink. So there are two clocks going on here. The physiological one, which is the, the process of being thirsty, kidneys, throat and so on, and brain and so on. And the mental one, being thirsty, having the experience of drinking something, being happy and so on. Leibniz said, we have two parallel worlds. We just have the illusion that they affect one another. And of course, he was a deist. He believed in God. So for him, it was not a problem. I think that it's genius, but it doesn't help us. It doesn't help us much. Uh, no, actually, uh, sorry, I was confusing. This was, sorry, uh, this is parallelism. Matter and mind run parallel to one another. So this is Leibniz. Uh, others uh, proposed epiphenomenalism that said, only one thing affects the other. Somehow my, my uh, brain gives rise to my consciousness, but my consciousness never interferes with, with, uh, with my brain, okay? So, sorry for, uh, for the, uh, the, uh, the confusion. Parallelism says that there are two worlds which do not interact with one another. Epiphenomenalism says there are two worlds one of them affects the other without somehow violating the conservation laws, but the other is not affecting the, the first, and this is how we have this mystery. There is something mysterious, but we don't have to fear for conservation laws, and we don't have to worry about, about physics. And then there is identity theory, which actually is so dumb that uh, I have no time. They say that they are the same, uh, so, sorry for saying that, but they say that they are the same, but we think they are different. It should be come back to physicalism, but they admit that there, there, is, there are two sides of it. And yeah, and there is one which I like. I don't have much time to it, and it says something very radical. It says, here is your problem. You have studied physics, chemistry, biology, and neurophysiology. You went up at the scale of complexity, and then you came to the brain, and you say, ah, there is something mysterious there. There is consciousness, and I can't... Uh, understand how the working of the brain with the more and more details that I work and understand the brain, I still can't understand why there are conscious experiences. Perhaps you neglected something from the very beginning. Perhaps there is something in matter itself, in any grain of sand, in any rock, in any drop of water, in any molecule, in any particle, that there is something mysterious that you don't understand, and then when they become very complex, they give rise to consciousness, here is your mystery. I admit that I like this, this one. But here is now my, my question, and here I come to what I believe to be my original contribution to the, to, to the debate. I didn't solve the problem, I made it, I believe I made it much worse. <laughs> so here it is, all of them are non-interactionist dualism, common to all of them, <laughs> is the consciousness in essentialism postulate, okay? For every action which looks like a consequence of a quail, yeah, I forgot to say what a quail is. Red, the subjective experience of red is a quail. So science is talking about quanta. In consciousness has to do with qualia, the quality of red versus blue versus yellow, or the quality of sweet versus salty and so on which are distinct from the structure, from the process of seeing red or tasting it. So the problem is with qualia, and uh, here goes the, the postulate. For every action which looks like the consequence of some quail, there is a neurophysiological explanation, explanation which ignores qualia altogether. So I still say that uh, Romeo kisses uh, Juliet because he loves her, Actually, it is a, short and, a shorter way to say that Romeo kisses Juliet 
due to very ancient, uh, you know, instincts uh, and having to do with his uh, education and so on, which is a consequence of earlier physical causes. So this is what is common to all these theories, which I think are ingenious, but it kills actually what is the most essential part in our lives, and this is the qualia, the quail, the subjective experience. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.